George, it's great to have you back. Good morning. Great to be here. Good morning. It's actually a really opportune time to talk about this because of some of these reports of denial of service attacks in Ukraine last couple of days. Talk to me about some of the metrics in this report. Where are we essentially? Well, unfortunately, cybersecurity and the state of it continues to get worse each year uh, from an attack perspective. And we've called that out in our report. When you look at uh, some of the stats, 82 percent um, increase in, in ransomware related data theft and extortion, this is a uh, this is a key measure. Now, what we mean by that is when organizations get hit by ransomware, not only are they have to, not only do they have to pay for the recovery of that data, but they're actually being extorted uh, if they don't pay by the adversaries who are leaking this data on the internet. So essentially, they're losing control of the situation. Uh, it's almost like a hostage crisis where you know hostages are being injured until someone pays, and it's uh, it's really problematic. Uh, we've seen that increase. Uh, companies have gotten better in restoring their backups, uh, but the adversaries are continuing to evolve, and this data leak is really impactful because of the potential fines and, uh, and, and government sanctions in some cases uh, if critical information is leaked. Right. Uh, and you say adversaries. Are we talking uh, state or non-state actors, or is that line so blurry now it's hard to tell the difference? Well, it's a great question, and it, it is being blurred. If you look at North Korea, obviously a state actor, but they do make a lot of money on uh, ransomware-related attacks. It's a great way for a country uh, that's under embargo to get money in and out of the country. Um, when you look at uh, organizations like Russia, you know, a lot of uh, the state-sponsored actors are able to moonlight uh, in off hours, and, uh, and we see activity from them uh, as part of the e-crime group. So we basically break this down into three key areas or three key adversary groups. One is nation state, the second one is e-crime, and the third is hacktivism. And we've seen activity uh, on the rise in all three of those. But one of the problematic areas is that we've seen a lot of the nation state uh, techniques and, and, and their weaponry actually uh, move downstream into, e into the e-crime world. What that means is e-crime actors know how to weaponize something that might have been created by a nation state actor. Maybe they couldn't create it themselves. They know how to weaponize it, and they've been very effective at doing that, uh, particularly in the ransomware area. Hey, George, it's Deirdre. We've also seen more attacks on critical infrastructure. I wonder if you think that that will continue. And also, you know, over the last year or so, we've heard about the end of sort of voluntary standards, the government trying to get private enterprise to tell them more, comply more. Is that actually happening? How can you tell? Well, I, I think when you look at critical infrastructure, it is an area that uh, we really need to pay attention to. And, and a lot of the critical infrastructure, infrastructure is not, not government-owned, right? It's private-owned or it's kind of a quasi-government entity. And unfortunately, um, it, it's, um, the technologies uh, tend to be older, older operating systems, things that aren't always patched because people don't want to update them for fear that they might uh, cause an outage. Uh, I think when you look at some of the pipeline attacks that we've seen in the past, it really has given us an indication of how brittle and fragile our infrastructure is. And I can tell you from a government perspective, uh, it, it has a lot of attention. And I think hopefully we're moving in the right direction with, uh, with some of the, uh, the recommendations and the standards to upgrade those systems. George, you, you mentioned in the report that 62% um, of uh, detections were malware-free, meaning that you know, through previous breaches, Hackers essentially got access to the stolen keys and are, are then just using them to, you know, open up uh, outdated locks and, and walk right in. What's the baseline that that 62 percent is off of? How high do you expect it to go? And, um, you know, is security updates and, and patching the answer or just more proactivity uh, on behalf, mm -hmm. you know, from, from the institutions that are, that are getting hacked? Sure. Well, let, let's break that down for a minute. So when, when we talk about these intrusions, a, a lot of folks think it's just malware related. I get a bad file, I click on it or a link or something, uh, and it infects me. Uh, and that's part of it. But as we just uh, discussed, 62% don't, don't actually use malware. So what is it that they're actually using? Uh, they're taking advantage of vulnerabilities in, in uh, operating systems or email services. They're taking advantage of uh, credential theft, that is stealing your username and password. Uh, and they're able to get onto a system and then blend in as a normal user. And this is why zero trust and identity are so important because 
in today's day and age, it's not just about stopping malware. At CrowdStrike, we do a lot of that, but we also focus on identifying uh, what we call living off the land, blending in, looking like an average user, using the tools that are on uh, traditional operating systems and then moving about laterally. So what's really important now and what we're calling out here is the fact that zero trust, not trusting anything in your environment. So if you have a laptop, a workload in the cloud, a server, it has to be its own sort of armored system and it can't trust other things it's interacting with. Uh, and that's a big part of not only our strategy, but the government strategy. And it's a key way to actually help defend against these attacks that we called out.